I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we are doing a poet who's... Is it okay to just call him a contemporary poet? Yeah, I suppose so. In the Chinese sense, at least in my master's studies and whatnot, anything after the Cultural Revolution is called contemporary. So dong Right, and there's a very strict genre categorization or periodization is, is the right word. Absolutely, there's a very, yep. The very strict periodization where you have modern, which is post-1919 um, with the May 4th movement, and then... Uh, uh, 1919 to 1949 is Xian Dai, modern. Right. 49 to 76 is is socialism, isn't it? I don't, you know what? It doesn't have like a Zhong Dai. I think it's just like Mao, like the Maoist era, something like that. I hadn't thought yeah. about that. Anyway, but I know 76 to now is Dong Dai, the, the contemporary. They prefer just not to talk about the Maoist era yeah. in literary no circles. No one talks about there's... no. <laughs> yeah, I just know we're being at, at Nankai and there being a, a, a class called the 17 Years of Literature from 49 to 66. So right before the Cultural Revolution, there's like a whole period when literature is kind of allowed to be written, quote unquote literature. Anyway, nobody took it. <laughs> nobody took it my, my classmates were like yeah nobody wants it and they said of the like four people in the class like basically the professor and the students spend the whole class like talking about what doo doo all that literature was so anyway but the, the poet we're talking about today is he's actually very pretty much good he's very good Shurji is a poet who tends not to get a lot of press He he's very much overshadowed by the quote unquote Meng Long poets who well, he was actually their contemporary. He wrote in some of their journals and stuff, but he was writing a good decade before they were writing anything. So, Rob, so, when was he when was he writing? So, well, that's just the trick. See, the the poems that we're talking about today, uh, the reason the main reason I chose them wasn't because they were like my favorite in the whole collection, although they are pretty good. A- as someone who tends to prefer classical Chinese poetry over modern poetry, I was surprised cuz I, I really liked these. These reminded me of Haidze and his uh, uh, his poetry on on like the the giantness of the ocean. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of that. But anyway, these are written in sixty five and sixty eight. So right even before the Cultural Revolution, he's writing this poetry. But that's incredible because I mean sixty five. It kind of makes sense, even though it. It's a little weird because it feels like 1980s poetry, but to be writing this stuff in 68 when the Cultural Revolution is in its full swing, that's that's just kind of stunning to me. Yeah, well, and he's his life is interesting. In, in at least the bio in the book I've got, he does military service a little bit. So in 71, he joins the military in Jining in Shandong province, and then two years later, he quits. In the official bio in the book, it says, after this point, his spirit was divided. That's what it says. Sometimes basically <laughs> positive, sometimes sometimes negative. I know, it's really it funny. Sounds almost actually... like, it sounds almost like Dante waking up in the middle yeah. of the, his life. <laughs> yeah, but in 68, he also was a part of a kind of a... Not not a, This is too early for the sent down to the countryside thing, but this is like volunteer to go work in the countryside core sort of thing. So he has this, he does this, then he leaves the, the go to the countryside core thing and goes back to a fishing village. And then he decides, you know what, I think I, I, I do think I want to join the military. Joins it, two, two years later, quits. So he has all of the symptoms of someone who tries to get into the swing of things, the, the spirit of the, the age, and can't do it. He just can't hang with it. And his poetry is very much a part of that, expressive of that. When I was at Nankai, he was one of the poets that my classmates were like, oh my gosh, you got to read this guy. Like, he's not the best of the poets from that era, but he's so, so important. Like, he's the precursor to so many things. He expressed a lot of things that people were only really able to express later. He did it earlier. The earlier part is what interests me, because, you know, you, you, you reacted very strongly when I said 65 and 68. Y- you didn't write poetry like this in the 60s i mean no we're getting into some seriously hot political times you don't go around writing dissident poetry in the 60s if you were smart you just didn't say anything because people who said stuff uh for example in the anti or in in the the 100 flowers movement which is in 57 i believe uh you know there are legions of stories of people who got up because they thought the party wanted the them to criticize the party so that the party could imp- 
improve itself and they got up, they said something that they felt obliged to say, then they got uh, branded as a rightist for the rest of the the Maoist period and they you know had to clean toilets or something. I mean, it was very common, but Scherzer was one of the people who sort of squeaked through and what was, I, he, you know, was read, he publishing this? He was not published because there's nowhere to publish it. Where would you right. publish something like this? The first we read of Scherzer is in the very, very famous journal today, Jin Tian, which was put out by Beidao and Mang Ke and some of their friends in the late and 70s. That's in the late 70s, right? Yeah, that's 78 is Jin Tian. Uh, I mean, it's just an absolutely legendary journal. It's kind of, yeah, it's the, the watershed journal for the 1980s. Um, Rob, right. I think we're kind of getting into the, the weeds here. Can can you just read your translation? Yeah. So this, this is part of a trilogy, the poem we're talking about today. We may talk about more of it, the trilogy that is later. We'll see. We'll in see how this one goes. Yeah, in a later podcast, yeah. But the trilogy is just called three, effectively three poems about the ocean. And the first one is called The Ocean and the Waves. I'm going to read my translation. The crashing waves, the deep ocean, lead me to seek passionately, cause me to look forward eagerly, because I am sometimes melancholy. I love the vastness of the ocean's breast. Because I am sometimes shy, I love the ocean's incomparable strength. It is because my abilities are ordinary that I crave the ocean's extraordinary size. It is because my appearance is ugly that I adore the ocean's azure blue and shining clarity. I will always have a song of praise for you, O resounding impassioned waves. I will always have admiration for you, O profound as your ocean. It's a fairly short poem, and on the surface, if I read you this poem, there's no way you would say, wow, that's some political dynamite right there. You better be careful with that. But the thing that makes it such... Uh, political dynamite is the fact that it's being written in a period when all Maoist, all literature is ordered to be Maoist, right? And to be Maoist, it has to be clear, crystal clear as to what you're talking about. The goal of Maoist literature is so that a peasant can hear it read to them, because again, there's a lot of illiteracy at this point in China. A peasant can hear the, the work of literature read to them and understand it without having to think through it. No intellectual work needs to go on when they're thinking about symbols and other stuff. Any symbolism has to be very, very clear. You shouldn't have to have a college education to understand a good Maoist poem. This right, but is not a good Maoist poem. And in particular, this is something, and we will, dear listener, be talking about the Monglong poets later, but what defines the underground poetry coming out of the 60s and 70s and especially into the 80s Sorry, is... Sorry, Just really quickly. You said Monglong poetry. Monglong is misty poets. They are coming out in the late 70s, early 80s, and they're a kind of underground poetry. This is also a kind of underground poetry, but it's not Monglong poetry. It's, it's not, not misty yet Monglong. Poetry. Yeah. So I keep using that term. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. The, the term misty was sort of attributed to pejoratively by a journalist who was like, I don't basically, I don't get this. What is going on? This is just too misty obscure, but this was on purpose um, because a lot of these poets were very, very tired of exactly like you said, there's it's everything so easy to understand. and so straightforward. It felt like there was no room for the individual. Like, what do I think about this? Well, there's nothing to think about a Maoist poem it's it is exactly what you're it not supposed like. to you're not supposed to think about a maoist poem you're supposed you're to not immediately comprehend it and then be done with it right exactly <laughs> and that's why the so poetry they, was so bad yeah and so a lot of these poets these underground poets start intentionally muddying the language so that you have to think about it because for them the thinking about it created an individual space it's a place where while you were working through the meaning you were all by yourself in your head which is pretty attractive. Now, this poem, like I say on the surface, doesn't sound like political dynamite, but there's a couple of things that you should clue into. One, this is a guy who comes from the countryside. I didn't say where he was born, but he was born in Shandong, born into a fishing family. So very much a commoner. This isn't an elite Beijing intellectual. This is somebody who comes from the countryside, worked in the countryside, went back to the countryside, and 
And when he says things like, it is because my abilities are ordinary, or it is because my appearance is ugly, I'm shy, I'm melancholy. Basically, he's all the things you're not supposed to be if you're a good Maoist peasant. A good Maoist peasant is strong, they're confident, they work hard for the motherland and all of those things. A good Maoist peasant doesn't think of themselves as ordinary, ugly, shy, and contrasting themselves negatively with the ocean, which, Lee, I know you're aware, but the ocean was a very big symbol in Maoist China as well. I mean, the sun was usually Mao. The ocean could be a lot of things. One of them was sort of the the people themselves being brought together as a whole, like the, the great Maoist sort of Marxist masses, right? Which is also kind of interesting here, because if that's what he's saying, you know, he's saying, look, I'm ugly. The masses, the quote unquote Maoist Marxist masses over there, they've apparently got this great thing going on me. I'm nobody. But, but there's something interesting going on here with the tension in this poem between the individual wave and this massive ocean, right? Like he is praising the ocean on the surface, but I got the sense that that this poem is kind of subtly hinting that being an individual wave, that standing out from the ocean, literally standing out from the ocean, is is a positive. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to to read this poem again because its meaning is so ambiguous. But I felt like I uh, he was he was sort of praising the wave. To a, to a certain degree, or he, he's at least not condemning the wave, whereas in Maoism, you're supposed to, to reject the individual wave and only see the ocean, right? Like the wave cannot be separate from the ocean, which of course is, is true, but this poem subtly gave a bit more individuality to the wave than it felt like it should have for a Maoist poem. Could be. I don't know that I saw the wave, the individual wave. I can see how you would read that. Like, I mean, it just, if he just, is himself the wave, something like that. Just think about the title, though. The title, yeah. so you actually said it was the ocean and the wave, but in fact, it's the reverse. It's the mm. wave and the ocean. And it right. puts the wave first. So it's in in that, it's putting the individual wave first. And, and I mean, do you not see that tension there between the wave and yes. the ocean in this poem? Uh, possibly. I, I definitely see. I, well, I'm def. I definitely see the tension between the speaker and the ocean. And if you conceive of the speaker as a wave or as someone who wants to be a wave, that absolutely. What is interesting is the distance between the speaker and the ocean. Whether the speaker is expressing admiration for the ocean or for the crashing waves in the ocean, whatever. He's saying, "I'm over here. The ocean is over there. I admire the ocean, but I'm not the ocean." I'm something different. That's not a Maoist sentiment. You don't say, you know, hooray for the people. Not so much me, because I'm clearly not one of them, but, you know, good for them, I guess. Let me just point something out. So in that first, stand, the first two lines of this poem, Xuan Chang de Bo Lang, Shen Chen de Haiyang, so the crashing waves, the deep ocean, there is this sense that there is a parallelism. First comes the wave, then comes the ocean. And for the rest of the poem, there seems to be a kind of parallelism between the, 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 the narrator of the poem and the ocean. There's the sense that he's doing something, and then in the next line, he's like talking about the ocean. That's why I kind of think that there is this, this connection between the individual wave and the narrator of the poem. Yeah, I can see that. I, I can see that, especially when you read the first two lines that way and think the rest of the poem is sort of following that dynamic, which is, yeah, the speaker saying, yeah, I'm this way, but the ocean is this way, and I'm this way, but the ocean is this way. There's a very, very, very subtle sense of humor about a lot of this stuff. And I mean subtle, like there's no way you're even going to notice it probably the first time you read through it. This is a poet coming out of the cultural, well, not even the cultural revolution yet, Maoist China, the tone of the poem sounds like this rhapsodic, like, oh, the mighty ocean. It's pounding waves. It's azure, whatever. But then the, the, the next line is, I'm kind of actually kind of sad myself. But anyway, <laughs> the amazing ocean. Then he, can, then he brings it back down to something as, as simple as like, I'm actually kind of ugly. Maybe that's why I like how, how stunning the, like there's this, it doesn't work. You can't have, you know, 
there's a change in volume on the different lines. One line is yes. like 10 on the volume meter. And the next line is like two. And the, the, the thing that makes this so interesting is that in Maoist poetry, everything is amped up to 10. The entire era is spinal tap. It's just like <laughs> all the way to 11. Like, you know, there's no, there's no need for anything below that. Scream as loud as you can about the party and the people. And he's kind of doing that. He's like, hooray for the mighty proletarian ocean. Well, actually, I'm kind of, kind of bummed myself a little bit. And yet, and the reason this is such a fascinating dynamic is because that's, if you were going to write in the underground, you had to whisper. And he's actually writing a whisper into the poem. You know, you don't write, he's writing on a piece of paper. I, mean, I assume theoretically he could have just buried it underground and been totally confident no one was going to find it. But things were tight enough that even in a poem, you, you wanted to have a little bit of sticking to the party line, right? So anyone who's just a censor coming upon this randomly might go, well, he probably shouldn't have been writing things like, I'm ugly and sad and ordinary, but I like that stuff about the ocean. That's pretty great, right? Like, <laughs> there's, you know? a, there's a way you can read this as a perfectly acceptable Maoist poem, but if, if you read it, it's only if you read it really fast. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's a great point. That's a great point because that is how a lot of this literature, especially that comes after him, comes into being is poets going, hang on, let's slow this whole thing down because my whole life is parroting slogans, saying the right things in the right places, walking the right places and doing the right things. Let me just have an extra 10 minutes required of me to read something. That's kind of what I'm looking for. And so poems to, like this... To think you, about something. Yes, to think about something. Thank you. So you could blow through this poem and go, huh, I guess he likes the ocean a lot. If you slow down, you go, why, why, why is there such a volume shift in between those lines? But it's only if you ask why, which is exactly. not something that a, a Maoist uh, reader should do. Right. Now, one of my favorite things about Shurjur is he is a transitional figure. So the Hmong Long poets are going to write better crafted poetry than this. I'm not going to try to explain what that means in this, Thank you. this podcast. <laughs> you know I could. Oh, you know I could. You know I could. Because I'm, I'm the modernist, Lisa Classist. I, I always prefer modern poetry. It makes me sound like a, a weirdo, but whatever. But I do love the transitional figures, the ones who are not quite out of one era or into the other. Now, eventually, of course, Scherzer's poetry is going to sound very much like Beidals and Mankas and Duoduas, the sort of the quote-unquote great poets coming out of the, the 70s and 80s. But these early salvos are so interesting because you can see the seeds, right? You can see this, this I'm going to give you a Maoist kind of approach, but then in between those Maoist approaches, I'm going to kind of cut my hands and whisper to you something like, you know, actually... I really feel sad a lot. Just that, I kind of feel sad a lot. It's not even exactly what he said in the line, but that's how I'm paraphrasing it here. Disconsolate. Yeah, that's fair. Disconsolate, melancholy. There's lots of ways to translate it. But just that 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 whisper is it, it kind of it kind of pushes the door open a little bit. Any 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 poet like Beidou, a young Beidou, someone reading this would have gone, oh. Are we allowed to talk about that now? I didn't think we were allowed to write poems about being sad. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, it. it you may, and I, as we wrap this up here, uh, just to bring it back, you you may be the first person to have ever said the Maoist era is this is Spinal Tap. This kind of yes. amped up uh, uh, volume up to 11 as loud as it can get. But I, I think that's absolutely correct, and that's a good way to understand traditional Maoist uh, poetry and Maoist literature, and and there is something highly charged politically and and artistically when you turn down the volume. Uh, I think of the band Dire Straits, a 1980s band that uh, did their most famous for Sultan of Swing, but they were kind of a rejection of this loud music, as loud as you can get, MTV kind of uh, aesthetic. And, and it was they knew what they were doing they knew that they were being uh making a highly charged aesthetic move when you read shuju today you have to keep that in mind those kinds of whispering it would sound really discordant to a uh maoist reader 
to have this kind of volume down poetry. And yet I'm willing to bet that a whole lot of people, if they'd read this, they wouldn't have said it out loud, but would have read it and felt refreshed and felt affirmed. Like, you know, I do too. That's the way I feel too, right? And and I, I felt that when I was reading this poem. Yeah. And it's interesting too, coming off of, and this is this is going to be my final thought and then we can wrap this up, but you know, you and I, right before the podcast, we're talking about how odd it is that I prefer the modern stuff to the classical, which is not true all across the board, obviously. I, I, I love certain classical poets. He has and, to defend himself. <laughs> I have to defend myself because I'm afraid I'm going to get tomatoes thrown at me by Chinese literature scholars, but... Um, anyway, having spent a lot of time on the translation work I'm doing in the classics, reading this feels like a breath of fresh air for me because it is one of those things that on the surface you can just read and not think about. But if you choose to think about a whole lot of things are happening there that don't rely on knowing a ton of other classical references because one of the things I can't stand about, well, that's a bit strong, one of the things that is difficult for me with classical poetry is how densely allusive it is. I mean, if you're really going to get dufu, you have to have a concordance or some kind of index, something to help you parse the dozens of references he can pack into a, an admittedly masterful poem. You can't, this, read dufu, you can't read dufu without knowing how to read dufu. You have to yes. have someone explain Dufu to you for you to read Dufu and really read Dufu. It's it's almost exactly like reading Shakespeare if you don't know how to read Shakespeare. When I was in high school and they just threw Hamlet at me, I was like, okay, uh, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I can see what... Then I had a professor in college who knew this stuff backwards and forwards and explained all the little in-jokes, and it was brilliant, right? That's classical Chinese poetry. If you have someone to times explain 10. everything... <laughs> Times 10, yes, thank you. And they can walk you through every line. You go, wow, oh. that was incredible, right? But sometimes it's wonderful being given a poem to just read. It is very much just you and the poem. That That's what he set out to do. That's what the poets who came after him set out to do. And, and I feel like they really succeeded because you can just pick it up and read it. You don't have to have read thousands of other books. It can literally just be you and the poem. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it definitely is refreshing because classical Chinese is not only so uh, uh, referential and elusive, elusive with an A, but it's also just uh, as a language, it tends to be more ambiguous. So there are times when you just can't decide what something means. It could mean this, it could mean that. Um, this is something coming out of Paul Rouser. He has a, a primer on uh, classical Chinese, and he says that. He says, you know, sometimes we just, it could mean like three different things. Uh I definitely found knowing what the poem meant <laughs> refreshing. Uh, I still like <laughs> classical more, but but it was nice to just be able to kind of grasp something and understand its meaning and feel very confident of it. Uh, yeah. Rob, this has been a, a, a great poem. Um, we'll put your translation up on the website. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.